Hello, uh, welcome back to Space Door Live, Thursday Night Talks. Um, we're joined tonight by John Angerson. Hey, John, how are you doing? Good evening. Great. Well. Nice to have you on the show tonight. Um, and for those of you who are new to Space Door Live, thank you so much for joining us on YouTube and Facebook Live. Now, John is a seasoned photographer. And the reason he's joining us tonight is because back in December of 2020, he released unseen photos of the preparation of NASA's space shuttle mission, STS-72, uh, which happened in 1996. And tonight, we're gonna be having a look at some of those unseen photographs um, and talking about them with John. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, John. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Um, look forward to having a nice chat with you about it all. Um, yeah, fire away, as they say. Go with throttle up. Yeah. Great, great. I'm so excited for this one. Uh, welcome to Space Door Live if you're new here. Um, so let's go straight into it. How how did you get the opportunity to go behind the scenes of a space shuttle mission? Please tell me. Uh, quite a fluke, really. Uh, so interestingly, I was... In 19, so this was in, I'm trying to get my dates right here. So uh, in early 1994, 93, um, okay. I was photographing the, some people will remember, John Major, the Prime Minister at the time, had a brother called Terry Major Ball. Completely disconnected. I was photographing him in Berlin. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Channel 4 were making a film about him. After the, after the shoot, I went for a drink with the film producer of the film, and she said, oh, it was really nice working with you. Um, yeah. Our next film is about astronauts. We're looking for a photographer. Um, we'll give you a ring if it comes off. And I said, yeah, yeah, well, nice to meet you. About a year, a year and a half, two years later, um, I remember my pager going off with a really unusual number that I'd not seen before. And we used to have a, a U at the end of it, which meant urgent. So all you could send, so I thought, I don't recognise the number, phoned up and it was the film producer and she said, we're on, it's all go, we've got clearance, the film crew is starting shooting next week, can you join wow. us, we'll all fly out together. Yeah. So then I, I literally arrived, I was quite young, I was in my 20s, mid 20s, uh, and then, and then the, the journey began really. Um, so. The production company were making a documentary which went out in cha uh, on Channel 4 in 1996, I think. It then, it then went to PBS in the States uh, after that. So they were shooting them, they were shooting a sort of fly on the wall, um, very cinema verite approach. So I couldn't really shoot when, the, when they were filming. So I, I was always usually one sort of step behind them. So they'd be filming over in one corner i'd be waiting yeah i'd see the cameraman move on and i'd go into that space because i'd be out of shot yeah um, and the really interesting thing i story the story behind this is i shot predominantly the whole set in color i was shooting mm -hmm. color transparency for magazines who because channel 4 wanted images to publicize the film so i shot maybe 40 50 rolls of color transparency but um i had a couple of small cameras shooting black and white uh, and if I'm honest, the black and white probably work better because visually, because NASA is just you're bombarded with colour. Everything's either orange or white, so it's quite yeah. so. Um, so these these the black and white images just sat in uh, in one of those neg boxes just there up there. Um, I think I printed a couple up and made a few little postcards and prints and whatever, and just completely forgot about them. And then during lockdown. Um, I was listening to a Zoom call with another photographer uh, who was saying, um, if you've got nothing else better to do, go yeah. back to some old work and re-edit it because um, you won't have the emotional connection to the work anymore because you've forgotten yeah. it. So you might, you'll create a new story, you'll create a new narrative because you're looking at it with fresh eyes. So I yeah. thought, oh, I'll get that box down. And I got my light box out, got the negatives out. And then suddenly this revolution revelation i thought i don't even remember taking that picture i don't remember taking any of these pictures so um i should stop talking a bit of this chase <laughs> it's about people isn't it um yeah let's 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 uh, look at the, some of the stuff um 
So I, 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 um, I re-scanned and remastered all the original negatives. Um, and I don't think if it had been for lockdown, I probably wouldn't have ever, ever done it or ever got around to doing it. Um, and by pure chance, uh, a designer that I work with quite a lot wasn't that busy because of lockdown as well. So I, I kind of called him up and said, I've got these pictures. Let's do a book really quick. Let's see if we can do it. Because uh, the last book I did, did took about four or five years to, yeah. to put together. So literally from scanning the negs to printing it and to selling it, probably about three months, which is quite unusual for a photo book, um, particularly one that's self-published. Um, so yeah, so here's some of the, the sort of images that I took. That a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of the work was uh, taken at the um, known as the Wet F, which is the slang name for the uh, the neutral buoyancy lab, where they've got a huge pool, which I'm sure all of you have seen. If anyone is into NASA, where the astronauts are sort of winched down into water uh, to simulate uh, weightlessness. So I spent, and the main. Uh, the main um, purpose of the mission was to test a new spacesuit. So this is this is Leroy, and uh, uh, no, this is Winston, Winston E. Scott, uh, who's testing the new, and that's the spacesuit that he'd just got into, uh, or prior to him getting into it, rather. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's Winston being winched in on the left, and that's the back, you know, obviously the, the suits were all heated, and uh, you can imagine, I think, I did do some research on the cost and development of spacesuits. Quite incredible. And they have um, each as each astronaut. It might have changed now, um, but each astronaut has a. Um, there's like one 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 fits uh, one fit. There's like one size. Yeah. Like later missions, they change the size of them, so you could have, you know, a bespoke made uh, space spacesuit. And the cost of them was something astronomical. It was something like, yeah. I think they're sort of half a million dollars each. Uh, and the other, the other main uh, uh, reason for the mission was to uh, collect. Uh, I think it was so pulling a, a Japanese satellite. I think do some repairs on it and then you know release it back in air. Um, so this is uh, Koichi, the guy at the top here. Um, he was the first Japanese astronaut to um, actually do a moonwalk, uh, to do a spacewalk. So he was he became quite famous in Japan. He's like a bit of a superstar. Uh, uh, celebrity in Japan now and this uh, chap uh, below him is uh, Daniel T. Barry who was nicknamed uh, Dr. Doctor because he had a doctor of medicine and a doctor of, um, of science and he also has the patent for Nike air shoe the concept of having air in the shoe so these guys were known as America's finest they are the, the top you know they're super brainy super fit america's finest there was one i remember one occasion because um i kind of arrived and I, my my approach is very a lot of people that have seen me work find it quite unusual that i don't really speak i don't really engage uh, i do a bit more now but when i was younger i was i was very i just sort of tried my utmost to not be seen to be there but sort of being be invisible yeah well, I remember I, I, a little bit ironic as a photographer. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think I think uh, I think if you if you get too if you get if you get too chatty, too involved, you end up spending too much time having to talk. You miss pictures because you're too busy chatting. Right, so yeah. I, I, w I was always very uh, literally hiding behind things to sort of keep out of. And I'm, I'm naturally quite shy. I think mm -hmm. maybe don't sound shy now. But I'm not sure when I'm talking about something that I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, so I, I just remembered uh, the shot in the top right. I remember shooting colour and uh, this, these new flash guns had just come onto the market. And I was fiddling with this. I just bought myself this new flash gun. I couldn't work out how to set it. And uh, uh, Daniel T. Berry comes over to me. He goes, oh, uh, you're John, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, uh, I have a problem with your flash. I went, yeah. He went... <laughs> He basically sort of reprogrammed the back of the flash. He went, I think we'll find you need to do the uh, the guide number of this flash gun is 45, 80, 70. And basically, these guys are, are good photographers as well. Yeah. You know, they're, well, they're, they're top of their game scientists, aren't they? So mm -hmm. and at that moment, I suddenly thought, these guys know what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the the the, uh, the endeavor 
the Endeavour uh, spacecraft or uh, orbiter. So we got a chance to go up uh, for a couple of days filming. Again, a, a lot of a lot of the time it was really kind of quite hard because the main purpose of the of being there was um, was for the film crew. So I was always like a bit of a tag on, but I remember I remember sort of persuading one of the techs to help me get onto a gantry to shoot a shot of the of the actual um, the actual shuttle. Yeah. So I'll just go back one. So we we just come back to uh, sort of twenty twenty. So whilst I was um, googling and researching, adding new captions and trying to work out a bit more of the history of the mission, um, I came across. Uh, in the in the U.S. National Archives, I typed through a Google search. I came across this huge, sort of four thousand, four thousand high res, seventy mil scans um, uh, of 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 images shot by the actual actual astronauts out of the windows or the viewing the viewing the viewing holes and platforms. Wow. Okay. So, so suddenly, I've got this whole new set of images that sort of give you a kind of different layer to the whole all of the work you yeah. get this you know and you've got all the time coding along the side of the image of the mission so then i began sort of like looking at all these fascinating images that were shot by the um shot by the, the same astronauts um again really good photography you know they, they're good yeah. photographers they know what they're doing and they're shooting 70 they're shooting on a hasselblad handheld out of a window of a moving object, you know, that's yeah. some feat in itself, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so there's all sorts of different landmass. Like if you look in the book, there's, all, you know, I've, um, I've, you know, taken some of the original, you know, uh, some of the original metadata that they've got with them, which is quite fascinating. Because a lot of these, a lot of the, uh, a lot of these images were shot on infrared film as well. Uh, again. Shooting infrared film is no easy feat, especially when you're in space. Um, so this whole new uh, um, archive of images, I kind of, you know, um, started playing with putting the work in a, some sort of form of, you know, a different layer to the work. So I keep layering yeah. it up for giving you more information. If you if you go back to, if you go back a few slides, sure. Well, I, had, I had a question on when. Um, Winston is getting into that pool. Yeah. Uh, Winston here being... Yeah, that one, just there, yeah, just there. Like, you're so close to the astronauts going through their testing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, I think it was only... Um, a, the mission was only a couple of weeks or less, um, and they had a whole 12-month training course. Yeah. yeah. So how, how did it feel I, I was, to be I was so coming, close? I was coming to the end of... Um, coming to the end of the... the the T minus, they call it the T minus to lift off. Um, I think yeah. what I, I, I find quite fascinating now when I look back at it, I just don't think these images would exist anymore. I don't know because there was no internet, yeah, there mm -hmm. was no Instagram, there was no Facebook. So, kind of almost being a photographer was kind of almost oh, there's a photographer from England. There was no other, <laughs> there was no camera phones, you know. Yeah. There was no the astronauts would have been you know taking pictures of themselves and there would be everyone you know instagramming and what twitter and the, the, so it was almost like the sort of the, the sort of the final years of of document having that kind of access where yeah. you can get quite in you can record quite an intimate period of time if that makes sense from a yeah. being a sort of classic observer of a, a group of men you know highly skilled highly motivated you know we're talking sort of band of brothers here these guys you know are being put in a in a glass tube in, in a metal metal tin and you know thrown up into the sky yeah, and then they miss missiled into space yeah and, and 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 what i found really fascinating with it it was almost like being in a uh when i've been photographing in a uh, in, a, in a with a football team or a sports team, there was like they all had nicknames. Um, uh, Kyo, 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 the Japanese guy was called the man. He just they just referred to him as the man. Uh, yeah. Doctor, doctor. Uh, 
and they used to have this funny joke about making sure they um uh what was it put the wheels down there was a running joke between the pilot and the and the commander to put the wheels down when they uh, land. He says, yeah. see you later don't forget to put the wheels down there was all these kind of like you know football jokes where we would it would have been a, a match interestingly the pilot was of quite a well-known american football player or college level um uh, brent jets jr which is a great yeah. name it sounds like something out of flush flush gordon um oh uh, there, there's some pictures here that are quite uh quite fascinating some of these of the actual uh of the actual shuttle and that's the satellite i believe that they had to um you know and that that's that's the that's the first japanese the first japanese spacewalk he wasn't actually the right. first japanese in space uh but he was the first one to do a spacewalk and uh, uh an eva i think is the correct terminology i would probably yeah. be corrected um so there's there's some more of the uh the fit checking for the suits on the right and then there's that's the shuttle on the way to 30 39 b which is where all the all the shuttles launch from i still think they might there still might be a connection to that i think uh space spacex still goes from 39b again i'm sure someone online will know um and this is the commander here on the right uh brian brian duffy who uh i'm just reading the caption now was a veteran of space flight he did 40 days 17 hours 54 minutes and 50 seconds in space so seasoned astronaut and this is uh our, our friend uh brett jet jr in the actual cockpit of the endeavor um and there was a nice moment after because after after a few weeks i became you know i i was still quite quiet the quiet english guy in the corner um but uh he, he after i took a few shots of him he said uh uh do you want to sit do you want to sit in the in, in the in, in the in the in the pilot seat wow so i'm pretty sure somewhere there's a photograph it's probably in the color there's a shot of me yeah. sort of standing there you know <laughs> like uh, i i've always it's, i've never quite known how to how to publish that picture or how to because it should actually be the other way around it, it it's almost up that picture's almost upside down because if you imagine the position of the shuttle you're facing upwards so you're sat back like this yeah. so he's upside does that make sense to everyone so that's the shuttle is vert is in a vertical position yeah. so i'm literally sort of upside down like this trying to get and i i, I did think about running the shot the, the other way around but i that that's how it does that makes i'm sure people will understand what i mean yeah <laughs> um, so just going back to um so the thing about the intimacy if you look at some of these some of these images on the top in the top left again i i, I just i just maybe you you would get this sort of material now but i just found people people were so unaware of, of a photographer being there and it was it was it was sort of sort of unheard. photography and taking images of oneself and as what as a team or of each other and sharing it the idea of sharing a photograph like yeah. to us now i could send you a, a whatsapp picture and you'll get it within seconds none of that none of that was there then so i don't i think photography and Im imagery and the movement of images was a much more kind of um unique thing so when yeah. i said you know uh when i said when when they'd stopped filming so can, can I, is there any chance i could come back to your house to do a shot of your home because it'd be really nice to get some off you know off nasa pictures and they were just like you know really honored that i'd, I'd asked to go back to their house oh, and, wow, okay uh, it, it was it was like i just think i think photography particularly documentary photography and particularly in in america there is and was a kind of great respect for photographers and they kind of understood that it needed recording if that makes sense was yeah to capture the moment because it was all new because now everything's captured yeah, yeah. everything mm -hmm. everything we do and see and eat and touch and whatever, whatever is recorded whereas yeah. back in back in these days a, a guy with a camera particularly from england it was like oh wow you know 
He's putting a lot of time in, isn't he? He's, you know. yeah. um, By the so, way, just just to make it clear to the audience, uh, when we say back in the day, it's early 1996. <laughs> um, and so that's some of the. So this is in. Uh, this is some of the. They they would they had to choose their meals when they were on board. So this was them testing. And interestingly, I the guy who organised the food said, "Do you want some?" So I tried a bit, and he said, "Oh, do you want to take some home?" And I went, "Oh yes, please." Anyway, so during lockdown, I thought I'm sure I had some space food, so I emptied my. I've got a. I've got a shipping container down the road. So I found the NASA box and I thought they must be in here. They must be in it. Then suddenly I found this sort of plastic bag and, a, sort of, and it just literally, the whole thing had just rotted into this powder. So it was 25 years old. So, but I did, <laughs> yeah. And even, even the stickers on it at all, at all, lucky it was in a bag actually, cause it could have trashed the other stuff. Uh, and so that's uh, mission control uh, here. And like uh, this picture at the bottom left here, it always reminds me of like the Last Supper. That's the uh, the the, bre the, 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 the the breakfast before before launch, and that's our Japanese friend again. And that's the Capcom. Um, so a train a, a trained astronaut is the only person who's allowed to communicate with the with the uh, with the space shuttle. So everything goes through yeah. Capcom, uh, which is I think it's an abbreviation for uh captain of communication i would guess uh again he's quite a well-known um and then we uh this was like uh t minus one launch day so this is the closeout crew so the guy with the number one on his on his on his uh jumpsuit uh is the guy that that straps in every he's he strapped in every astronaut since the apollo missions i do believe he's actually retired i do think he's probably i think he might have died now but he was like it was tradition that he was the last human that they saw before they left earth and he was mm. the one who always uh, he would stand on their shoulders and then pull up their their seatbelt so so they'd be secure and upside, yeah. i'm still trying to explain the upside down thing um so yeah that's that's kind of and then there's my uh, there's my original pass that i found in the box with the the space food luckily that didn't get destroyed um so yeah that's sort of well, let's let's talk a little bit more about how how it feels to be so close to to the astronauts who are who are going on such an important mission and um four of the astronauts on sts 72 were actually going for their first space flight so four out of the six six of the mission crew are actually going up into space for the very first time so what kind of energy is there between the team? Again, it, it was it was like being amongst a, a, a really efficient, motivated um, football team. The camar camaraderie between them was almost like they they were really close, yeah, and they were really tight. Uh, but they they had a great sense of humour. I think I think it's often the way, isn't it, when there's something quite nerve wracking going on, or something you know potentially. Uh, dangerous or you yeah. know, monumental uh, you sort of tend to turn to humor and you know but they 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 were train they were training for like 18 months beforehand you know and they throw every possible the fi the film which I think is still available somewhere probably on VHS or something uh, but you just see them going through it again and again and every possible you know scenario is thrown at them uh, and how they respond to it yeah. Um, yeah but there was always like a bit of attention because there was all sorts of weird stuff going on with funding at the time like with most space travel there's always an issue with money isn't there and i think um i've written down here yeah this, the shuttle program cost 196 billion over its 30-year history which yeah. if you put that into you know modern day money it's a serious amount of money and congress were Never quite made their mind up what they wanted to do, did they? Some minutes they'd be going for it, and then they'd withhold, withdraw the money, and it was just like this constant sort of battle. What what kind of expectation did you have, like when you got the call that you're going to you're going behind the scenes of a space shuttle mission? Yeah. What expectation did you have when you were kind of flying over? I, I, 
I, I think I think it was I didn't quite really understand. Do you know when? Do you know when something? It's only when you look back at it, you realise. I think I was probably more. I was more worried about whether or not I'd got enough film, or you know, I was worrying about you know basics. You know, I I, I don't. I think, I, and you never know what what access you're going to get. That's another thing with being a photographer. It, it might. It's only when you get back that you realise you think, oh, hang on a sec, I got. I got quite I was in there you know yeah. because, you know I'm sure from my experience of being a photographer now sometimes you arrive somewhere and there's all this red tape or oh, you can't photograph here or what yeah, you've, got yeah. the wrong permit, you've got the wrong permit whereas then I think partly because it, I was coming in as a sort of tag on to a big production when I say big there was a cameraman a sound man an assistant and a producer um, and me so it wasn't a big like a it wasn't a big team, uh, but I, all, all the legwork and admin and negotiation, I have a feeling, and it was never actually um, explained, it was never really, uh, I never got to find out exactly what happened, but there was some connection to somebody quite high up. There was a connection made that gave the mm -hmm. access, if that makes sense. Right, okay. They, I, kind of might, want, they wanted to they wanted to kind of yeah, show this yeah and i think i think that the uh the the, the pbs channel uh in the us who were running yeah. it um second usage i think they had some play in it as well as in this is going out as a, on a public broadcast service so give these guys access but working with the film crew was again uh i never forget the cameraman who who's incredibly incredibly brave cameraman uh in fact quite legendary a guy called paul berif um survived a whole helicopter crash filming oil rigs uh filmed uh the new york fire brigade as the twin towers came down um part-time he was a uh a, a rest as uh, a lifeboat rescue in, in the river humber um but his, he was meticulous about making films he had some yeah. incredible rules that we had to abide to. One of them was, which might seem a bit strange, but no bag, no camera must ever go on the floor. It must always be on your shoulder due to the fact that film had, you had a gate in the camera. If you got a bit of fluff or a bit of dirt in the back of your camera, it would ruin the whole film because you'd get marks, you know, in the gate. You have to, there'd always be the camera system with a torch and a loop was always constantly saying you know checking the gate checking the gate checking the gate so there's no bags so i remember now whenever i i've still got a bit of that habit i never put my camera bag on the floor wherever possible I always have it on my shoulder yeah and he would never turn the camera off he would never ever turn the camera off and no one speaks when he's rolling you don't stop it if if something went wrong or it was i remember once the sound i went we'll have to do that again he hadn't got the sound he went absolutely bonkers we don't do things again we don't do things again this is a documentary you know we can't do it again and i was thinking to myself uh he, he's a good person to learn from so i learned quite a lot of watching him the way he i just remember the film always looking down at his his he had a big 16 mil film camera and it was always rolling even when he put it down for lunch it was always ticking over i remember the producer getting very um uh, very concerned about the amount of film that they were going through because all mm -hmm. the film was being shipped back with rush you know was being shipped back every uh, every couple of days the film was uh, i remember a courier coming and collecting with the exposed film so yeah great and what was it what was it like for you to kind of look back 20 24 years later at these images he said like literally those images would never have existed um so what was it like yeah. to kind of look at them 24 years on it was almost as if i don't remember taking them i remember taking the odd one that i really remember but all, i would say i just don't remember i have not i haven't looked at most of them for, like you said for 25 years and i just thought oh what it's really hard to get into that mindset of, it was almost like they weren't my pictures anymore if that makes sense i don't know why that was maybe i'd I just it was it was fascinating it was fascinating to go back and 
and think to yourself, uh, I took that. I don't, don't, I don't even remember pressing them. If I'm really honest, I think some of my most successful pictures of my yeah. career, I have no memory of taking. I have no memory of how I got there. I just yeah. look at them and go, well, that is that because I because I think a great documentary picture is a, is a reaction. Yeah, it's a response. Mm. It's not it's, it's 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 somewhere else. You just respond to it. You don't think, oh, that would be nice. Oh, oh, there's usually only ever one frame like the picture of the. I think it's always a good sign. If you've only ever got one leg of it, it's usually a winner. There's only one frame of that. I remember taking one frame and then the tech, the tech guys came and took the legs away, took the, yeah. and they went on to Winston. And there's only one frame of that on the left. Because I remember wow. looking through the legs going through them again, thinking, why didn't you take more, John? Why didn't you move left a bit? What were you thinking? Yeah. I was talking to my younger self over a life. Mm -hmm. saying, John, what were you thinking? Why didn't yeah. you do more of that? That was good. But it's I so interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah. So yeah, it, it it was a it was a it was like I was I was talking to someone else really. I was looking at other, another photographer's work almost because it, it kind of was. It's a diff, you know, it's twenty five years ago. I was a very different. I had very different ways of seeing and responding to things. Yeah, that's so interesting. Just um, a shout out to everyone watching in our audience. Thanks, Jack, Jed, uh, Tom, and Leah for tuning in tonight. I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the show. If you have any questions for um, John, let us know in the chat. Um, let's talk a little bit more about if you were given the opportunity again to cover a mission, whether it be NASA, SpaceX, ESA, um, what would you do differently? Wow. <laughs> That's so funny. As soon as I asked that question, uh, Jack from the audience asked the exact same question in the YouTube chat. You know what? I, do you know what I think? I'd like to say, I don't think I'd do anything differently. I just don't know if you'd be able to do it differently. Because I don't, I don't think, I don't think uh, having that. It's a bit of a. The, it's the, the word I'm going to say is wrong, but I'm sure you'll get the gist. That exclusivity. Yeah, because no one else is taking pictures now. If, you know, if there obviously is the odd photograph, but now everyone would be out with their iPhones. You know, everything would be. You know, they'd be coming in everywhere. Uh, whereas then it was kind of almost, I had it. I kind of had it to myself because photography wasn't, you know, wasn't as widespread. I, but I wouldn't do anything differently. No, no. Oh, that's so interesting, and let's talk. I'm really interested in talking more about the the dynamic that you get because you're so close to a team who's about to launch into space. How do you feel that you get that exclusivity that you're the only one there? You've come all the way from England taking pictures of these six um, American super superhumans. How does that feel? Um, we were in quarantine together as well, so we couldn't leave because of obviously we're in a, we're in a quarantine because of illness i can't give them my cold because they wouldn't be able to go up yeah. if i'm really really honest with you all i was worrying about as a photographer is you know is are my cameras working I'm, you know is my camera clean have i got am i getting the pictures have i got enough pictures you know how am i get you know does it do you know what i mean it was like am oh, yeah. i this is crap it's not working you're worried about the, doing your job yeah all, all the inner dialogue is not really about oh wow look where i am i'm with loads of super human astronauts it's more of a kind of survival mode, isn't yeah. it? You know, I'm here, someone's paying me to be here. Uh, yeah. The light in here is crap. You know, oh no, they're taking me there tomorrow. Oh, the light's rubbish in there. How am I gonna make yeah. this work? It's, it's those, it's only later, I think, when you obviously, looking back at it now, you can yeah. post rationalize the whole up and say, oh, well, you know, I was with this fine breed of America's finest men. But the reality is, all, all I'm thinking about is, you know, have I exposed that correctly? Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah, interesting. I, I think I think I, I think if I'm really honest, there was a little bit of hero worship going on there as well, particularly with um, uh, Brian Duffy, the, the commander. He had like a real nice air about him, and he was always really welcoming to me. 
he'd always okay. go, oh, hi, John, how are you? You know, yeah. and he kind of, I think he understood what I was, my job was, yeah, just a true professional, basically. He knew that he had to be photographed and he would do yeah. everything in his power to make me feel comfortable and make it all work, you know. There wasn't any kind of, oh, no, you can't photograph that or you can't film that. It was all very, we're all in this, we're all in this together, you know. Yeah. What well, Was there a moment where, where you were there and you were watching the training, do you remember a moment where you were thinking, like, wow, I ha I've got this on camera and people uh, are going to see this through my lens? I, I think I only did that because I remember... I remember driving, uh, getting back to, um, I was living in Yorkshire at the time, actually. I remember getting back to Leeds and phoning the lab where I got the films processed and speaking to the, the I remember speaking to the, manage, the manager of the lab and saying, look, I'm flying back in, blah, blah. I don't get in till 10 o'clock at night. You will be open, won't you? This is, this is it. This is it. This is, I've got 60 rolls of tranny that I need pressing. Can you? Mate, can I sit with them? <laughs> can I be in the... It, I, so I went into the lab and I sat next to the machine yeah. as they were coming off. Wow. You know, I, did them in, I did them in batches of five, I think, to make sure that if there was any... That sort of, you know, that, that paranoia for if the machine breaks. Well, if the machine breaks halfway through. And I remember sitting there at like, like at midnight. And as they were coming off, they were still wet. And I was sort of thinking, oh, oh. But then the black and white I processed myself a bit later on. So... That was quite nerve wracking. Yeah. But again, I, 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 I'd sort of got this sort of interesting system of like processing black and white film that kind of worked. Um, a lot of my friends always joke because I had my filter triple, or I had it double, I had it double filtered, so there was no chance of any contamination. And you know, I had all the walls painted a slightly off blue colour to get the ultimate print and all that stuff. Wow. Okay. In fact, Jack, who's watching, will understand what I was talking about. Um, who's listening here about the black and white, the black and white, perfect black and white print. Yeah. Well, we spoke we spoke a little bit about the commander of STS seventy two, Brian Duffy, um, mm -hmm. and how he was kind of this very uh, gentleman. And let's just answer Jack's question. Actually, like, which astronaut, past or present, would you most like to meet or photograph? Well, it, it's got to be uh, Yuri Gagarin, I think. The rush uh, the russian i think it has to yeah. be um or maybe i tell you what I don't, uh, maybe one of the one of the apollo one of the you know yeah strong or maybe who was the guy who was uh who stayed in the apollo and um who didn't actually go down uh for the moon landing what was his name, uh, his name? Great, yeah. i'd like to i'd probably like to meet him the sort of the guy that never gets the fame, but basically held the, held the team together. He stayed. Michael he stayed, Collins, yeah. Michael, Michael Collins. Collins, yeah. He stayed with the engine running, didn't he? Do you know what I mean? I'll keep, yeah. I'll keep it warm for us. <laughs> I'd like, I think I'd like to meet him because he would, uh, you know, the sort of guy that no one remembers, but yeah, was pivotal to the whole mission. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's not a uh, great a shot you didn't get? That was a good question from Lottie. Uh, was there a shot that you didn't get? Um, yeah, okay, Lottie, that's a really good, that's a really good question. The one shot I didn't get, and for years I regretted it. So basically, uh, the, f the film, the film was being, the film was being edited as we went along. They sent me, they ran out, they sort of said, "That's it, John. We've run out of money. Off you go. Go home. Sort it out." So I landed back and I thought to myself, I haven't got the launch picture. I haven't got the launch picture. And I remember lying in bed at night thinking, you haven't got the launch picture. And there was a way, theoretically, that I could have bought my own flight, gone back for the launch. And for years, I regretted that. Every time I thought of this project, I thought, John, I didn't get the launch picture. And then when I was researching, I realized it was a night launch. So all you'd have probably got was like a little stream of light in the sky, you know, a little like a firework. firework. Yeah. So it got away, but I, I kind of I forgave myself this year that it didn't really matter. Uh, so yeah, hope that answers your question. Yeah, would you would you be interested in um, doing more space photography? Yeah, I think I probably would. Yeah, 
uh, it would be nice to get, you know do something with SpaceX, I suppose, because those suits are rather cool, aren't they? They've got yeah. a, done a cracking job on the design of those. They yeah, have, yeah. I think uh, yeah. Elon Musk is very, very much worried about the aesthetics of everything. <laughs> so. Yeah. If I'm honest, I'm I'm a sort of a, uh, I'm, a, I'm I wouldn't say that I'm a you know my I'm a, I'm a massive NASA. Uh, I am a fan of NASA, obviously, but I'm, it's not mm. my specialist subject. I just think mm. I was kind of quite lucky. Yeah. The timings were, you know, the, the producer in Berlin, she was from Yorkshire. She knew I lived in Yorkshire. She liked the idea of someone from Yorkshire doing a big, you know, job for something in America. And we yeah. kind of got on quite well. And it all just, the timings worked. I kind of like was dropped in. It wasn't. It wasn't from necessarily through my knowledge of NASA or anything. Yeah. Like a series of pieces of good luck, basically. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about this publication now that you guys have published. Yeah. Um, what What does it consist of then? So basically, uh, the the lovely designer I work with, he, he he was he was quite funny. He said, "You've got three choices with a with a book." You can go small, medium, or large. What do you fancy? And I said, let's go large. So we've gone, we went large, and uh, we wanted to, um, we wanted to keep it sort of like um, big. So partly because of the 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 colour work, because I think the colour work looks particularly good when it's massive, and because they're seven mm. slides, uh, they reproduce beautifully. Uh, so and we've made it so it's. It's basically a Berliner. So I don't know if anyone remembers um, the Guardian at one point went Berliner size, which is slightly bigger. It's slightly bigger than a tabloid, uh, but slightly smaller than the broadsheet. It's quite long and thin. You can see, uh, see it's long and thin, um, and it's loose leaf. So, uh, and I've only limited. I've only made 125 of them. So. Um, so they are a limited edition. They are limited, and they can be signed if you need them to be signed. It was it was partly I thought to myself, you know, um, I've been really surprised by how popular it's been. It's been particular. I didn't realise that there's quite a lot of people that are really into the, the STS missions. Yeah, uh, quite a few people in America report it, um, and quite a lot of people. I've sold quite a few in Australia as well. Um, Sold maybe sort of twenty to Australia, which is quite. There must be a, a big, a big, uh, uh, a NASA thing in Australia. Yeah, well, um, if anyone, if, if anyone in the audience watching hasn't got theirs already, they can head over to the space space store website uh, and grab theirs. And if you want it signed and personalised from John himself, uh, just leave us a note in uh, when you're processing your order on our website, and we'll get it to you. Um, hopefully, once we arrange something, once uh, COVID restrictions ease. Uh, then we can get assigned a personalised copy out to you. We've got quite a few questions coming in from yeah. the audience now. Um, one from Kushbag86. Um, thank you for joining Kushbag86. Um, and he's asking, John, was there humour on the darker side? Um, and did they try any cheeky tricks on you? Good question. Uh, the humour on the darker side. It, 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 it was kind of banter. You know, that sort of locker room mm. banter. Yeah. Uh, and did they try any cheeky chicks on me? Man, uh, they probably did. I can't remember. I'll come back to you because I'm, I'm sure there was, there's, I'm sure there's something that happened. Uh, they took most of their fun out of uh, the Japanese chap because he was like the youngest and he was quite, quite short and they were just like always, always sort of like joking around with him. He was a lovely, yeah. such a nice guy. Uh, again, like I said, he's quite, I think he's a, quite a big celebrity in Japan now. He does quite a lot of uh, public talk, uh, speaking and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Crush Bag 86, I will come back to you when I think of something on any cheeky tricks. Great. Uh, Martin Rowe is asking, where is the NASA box now? <laughs> it's back at the lockup. I've, re I've, um, I've taken it out of all, yeah, it's been re, it's been re-archived and all the crap taken out of it. Yeah, and all the smelly food's gone. Great. Uh, another question. A real shame I couldn't keep it because I was, I was so excited about remembering that I had it, and then finding the box and seeing the top of it, thinking yes, 
what a great picture I could use that somehow. And then I just sort of picked it up and there's just like this sort of, you know, like a sort of sand yeah. lost. Sorry, carry on. That's great. Uh, Jack's asking, uh, is there one thing that was said to you on the on the on your mission um, that really stayed with you, or like you learned something from it? Yes, there was, Jack. That's a really good question, and I sometimes still use it. Um, you never ever, when you're communicating with someone, let me get this right. I might bungle this. Never say don't. Never say don't. Always say. Do not, because on a when you on a crackly, uh, you know, connection between Earth and one of the relay stations across the world. If you say "don't," it can sometimes sound like "do." When you say two separate words with a space, "do not." Mm -hmm. uh, if that help? So sometimes when I'm trying to be clear to someone, or if that makes sense, I say, "I, I, yeah. I do not do that." I don't say yeah. I don't. Do you know, like when you're sort of, um, I don't know, when you're yeah. trying to do something really efficiently and there's like potential, particularly my daughter, when she's about to run across the way, <laughs> do not do that. Yeah. And I say, yeah. And I sometimes remember that came from one of the NASA guys because they all speak in this. It took me the first three weeks to understand what a lot of them were talking about. They, <laughs> they all talk in code, don't they? They say, we're going for an EVA, we're going for a blah, blah, we're going for, you know, this is Capcom, Capcom, you know. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, I worked out what they were talking about. Yeah, so I've got yeah. some. I've got some. I've tracked down some. I've got the whole mission, uh, the soundtrack of the whole mission. The sort of like you know the the tapes. Well, listening to some of those tapes is fascinating. You know, you can hear, and especially some of the crackling between. You know, uh, it's a bit like the um, the the podcast. You know, the the uh, the moon podcasts. We hear that, you know, the feedback in the relay stations, and they keep changing relay stations, don't they? And say, we're now going to Ascension Relay, Ascension Relay. I find all that stuff quite fascinating. So maybe yeah. I am a NASA geek after all. I find, <laughs> I, I find that communication and all that kind of, I find that analog communication systems, or whatever it might be, I found, yeah. I've always found that quite fascinating. Oh, good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Good answer. Do not. <laughs> Are you planning to do anything with the audio files? Uh, well, I've done a, um, I've done a, a few little kind of like promotion things for the book, and there was, there was something on my website for a while where I had the book and I had the, you know, the the first the first fifteen seconds of the mission, where where mm -hmm. the lady says, and we have, and then it says, uh, go with throttle up and the usual. Uh, but I took it down because I found that I it was a, a, little, a lot of people don't like sound. I found a lot of people are a little bit off-putted by sound on a website, unless you make it uh, clear that you're, this is this has got sound on it. Does that make sense? So I need to maybe reconfigure and redesign the way. So it will say, click here for sound. And I yeah. couldn't find a way of doing it. So, so I take it off. Uh, well, Matt Rittle is asking if you got into the zero gravity simulator. No, unfortunately didn't. But Matt, I've always had this amazing idea. So my perfect photographic dark room, yeah, would be weightless. So you'd be listening to Brian Eno, yeah, you'd press a button and you would become weightless and you'd be in the dark room printing and you wouldn't ever touch the floor. So yeah, I've never been in the zero gravity simulator, but I have fantasized about having a zero gravity dark room. Wow. Okay. Yes, was it was there just following up from that question? Was there any part of the training that you photographed where you were like, "Whoa, this is pretty intense," or anything that was like super weird? Part of the, that uh, yeah, was part of the uh, training. Uh, well, yeah, the vomit comet was pretty, but I, uh, I only the cameraman, no sound man, just the cameraman. So basically, you know, when they go up and they they create uh, weightlessness by the plane goes into a dive or something, doesn't it? Yeah. And I remember the cameraman coming back from that, trying to make a, I just remember thinking, oh, geez, I'm so glad I got out of that. Because well, they're going, yeah, John, you're going as well. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, I can do this. I can do this. And then suddenly, at the last minute, I think they realised that I looked a bit pale. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they must have realised I was really scared. I thought oh, no. it would be fun. You know, you go up and then you, 
But yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I've forgotten what the question was. Anyway, well, the qu Matt's, Matt's question was asking what the zero gravity simulator about, about right. the zero gravity well, simulator. Okay, so, Matt, in response to your question again, uh, I almost did, but I think they saw that I wasn't up to the job. <laughs> What what other part of the training uh, of the training procedure was like shocking? Shocking. I, I think the quarantine was a bit scary because I had to go and see a doctor mm -hmm. and had to you know be tested for everything, which was a little bit embarrassing and a little bit like mm. like I won't go into detail, but I was tested yeah to make yeah. sure I had nothing wrong with me, and I you know I felt a little bit like whoa, 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 this is a bit this is serious stuff this and then. Yeah. I think everyone everyone might be able to relate a little bit about being in the quarantine part. Yeah, yeah, but like the sort of the yeah, having to yeah, I really did know that then that I was part of something quite serious, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think we've had a great audience in tonight. Just a shout out to everyone who's tuned in uh, once again. Let us know if you have any questions for John. Um, I'm sure we'll be really happy to answer them, um, and. Finishing off on another question about um, like this publication is what comes next? Is there something else that follows on from this uh, amazing NASA publication uh, that you guys have done? I do know that I don't really want to go back over some fight. I don't. I think the next. I think I'd like to go out and take some new pictures. Yeah. I, okay. I, we've all been locked down for so long now. I'm. I think I like a lot of. And, uh, creative people we just i just want to go out and take some even if it's you know just anything yeah. just get just get my teeth into doing something else uh i did actually think the other night whether i should go over my uh, another series i'd done on something else and i did actually get the eggs out and i thought john john this is nostalgia move away from boxes. <laughs> this is old work maybe do this yeah. when, you're when you're 80 or get yeah. your get your I'll give it to my daughter. I'll leave her a little note saying, these were quite good. Make a book for me, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to um, I'd like to take some new pictures, please, if I may, when, when Boris lets us out. Sure, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds really exciting. Well, it was perfect timing to release the, uh, the NASA SDS-72 almost at the 25th anniversary yeah. of the mission, uh, which is great. So, once again, if you haven't got your picture book already, um, head over to the Space Store website. You'll see it in our features section. Um, and again, if you want a signed and personalized copy from John, um, then just let us know when you're processing it on our website. And hopefully once lockdown restrictions ease, um, we'll get um, we'll get John over to our Space Store shop in Didcot and have you sign some copies for your wonderful fans. Great. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, John. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, Lash. Pleasure. Now, I hope I hope everyone who's tuned in tonight has enjoyed the show. Um, it's been great. It's been great learning more about behind the scenes of the images um, that you took uh, back in 1996. And yeah, just just some um, notes coming in from the audience about how how much they enjoyed it, how much they enjoyed listening to you. So thank you for coming on. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Um, and if you were, if you're, if you were tuning into Space Store Live for the very first time tonight, um, what we're trying to do on Space Store Live is bring space to everyone, everywhere, every day. And part of our mission has now evolved into this digital Thursday night space talk, where we bring you, um, bring you space uh, industry experts, people like John, who have done amazing things. Uh, related to the space industry. Thank you, Gerard Franco. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, uh, Martin Rowe. Thank you, Matt, uh, for tuning in. Um, it's been a pleasure having you guys on the show. And yeah, so uh, I forgot what I was. I forgot my chain of thought. Uh, I was saying how Space Still Live is bringing bringing space everyone everywhere every day, and part of the mission has been bringing these Thursday night space talks. Um, but we've also got an, a very um, exciting news coming up on how we're expanding our channels. So please do tune in to our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter pages uh, to stay, stay, stay tuned with what we're doing. 
And if you're not already subscribed onto our YouTube channel, please do to support our growing digital space community. Uh, once again, thanks, John. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. I hope you enjoyed it. I did very much. It was nice to chat. It was quite fun as well. So it's always nice, isn't it? Nothing too serious. Yeah. Lovely. Great. Nothing, nothing too serious. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again to the audience for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, we'll see you again next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. for the Space Roundup with space experts and astronomers Nick Howes and Terry Mosley. So tune in at 7.30 p.m. on our YouTube channel and Facebook channel. And we'll see you then. Thank you for tuning in.